here for our monthly meeting. Today is March 12th, and it is, according to that clock, 8.35. With that, um, Mr. Sachs, you and your team, we would appreciate having a conversation with you about the Spending Affordability Report. So thank you for being here. And if we need more chairs, we'll just move them up. So, Mr. Sachs, if you would please introduce the folks who are here with you, and um, and then go ahead. I'll, I'll start from the left. You know, Dr. Sun. Correct. Um, Milton Matthews, mm -hmm. who runs or head, is the head of CA Columbia Correct. Association. Uh, Mr. Sachs, so can you make sure your I can see that your mic is on, but just pull it a little closer. Okay, you you've I lost my voice on Thursday. So there I'm you just, go. So just speak right okay. into it, okay? So we have Dr. Sun, uh -huh. okay, Milton Matthews from Columbia Association, Dr. Richard Clinch. Morning. One of, one of our two economists this year. Thank you. Uh, Allison Del Zappo uh, from uh, Great Northrop, the Northrop team, real estate industry, and Steve uh, Poignant, who is Chief Administrative Officer with uh, Howard Bank. Great. Welcome, okay. everybody. Thank you for taking your time this morning to be with us. And I'm Steve Saxon, almost retired. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's the 18, day, 18 days. Well, oh. hot dog. Yeah. Yeah. Resentful, we'll just one out of the room. <laughs> 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 I, I want to start, uh, I sent you all a note over the weekend, but to uh, just communicate our deep loss, my personal loss of uh, Ed Waddell, who passed away on Friday night from a heart attack. Uh, he's been a 40-year friend of mine, uh, known him a long time. He, a very quiet person that um, gave greatly to this community, to many of the nonprofits and businesses in the community, and uh, was just a, a great mentor, uh, advisor. Uh, I met Ed when I joined the Rotary Club in 1978. Uh, worked with him at the chamber. Uh, he was on one of the first uh, spending uh, affordability advisory committees, uh, and I, I chatted that he used to. He never spoke much. If you know Ed, he talked personally to you, but in meetings he didn't talk much. He would he would drop notes about what he thought. They were always important notes, and I. Uh, He's moved up. He had moved up, I, I know, in the last – he had been on this committee uh, through the Ullman administration. I don't know how far before that, but he was on through Ken's administration and was reappointed by the, uh, County Executive Kittleman. Uh, and uh, he no longer writes notes. He would, he would uh, send me an email after the meeting uh, telling <laughs> me what he thought. So uh, we just uh, – we share beyond our committee with the community and the loss of a really great Howard County citizen. So I also want to um, send a personal note from County Executive. He wanted to express his condolence to, uh, to the loss of Ed uh, and also his family and also acknowledge his work for the Spending Photo Committee throughout the past many years under different administrations there, just acknowledge his public work. Okay, back to, to our work. First, we want to thank the Council for your work. Uh, with the county executive that has helped Howard County weather the last recession. And our county finances have been well managed um, in the past and today. And we applaud the council's role in that process because you know it's a, it's, a, it's a process not limited to one part of the government. However, the economic recovery has not translated into significant increased revenue. And we're concerned that most of the low-hanging fruit has been plucked from the tree. This is a great county, and we'll start with it. It's a great county. This has nothing to do with the health of the county, with its vibrance. But the committee follows the, has followed the changing demographic trends that we believe are partially and will be driving the numbers as we move forward. We are a mature county that is no longer achieving high growth rates. While our needs and desires continue to grow at a significantly higher rate than our projected revenue growth. 
So while we have um, looked at all of this, we, we want to focus on a couple of the, which you've heard last year, a couple of the headwinds, which we believe center around three demographic trends. The first is the increase in our over 65 population, people like me, our mature population. In the United States, the census predicts that by 2050, the over 65 population will have doubled. In Howard County, that will occur by 2025. That's a great, actually, comment on Howard County, that people want to stay here, that a lot of the early Columbia people who came here want to stay in place here. It's a great news, but it has consequences. And those consequences will be reduced revenue. You all know that 40 percent of our revenue comes from personal income tax. And people like me, when they retire, will still be comfortable, but we will not have the same level of revenue. And if we are wise in how we planned, a portion of that revenue will not be taxable. The other change, or the second change, is a change in the demographics of our residential development. And, and that's, again, we've talked about the move from large single-family homes to more multifamily and single-family attached. Now, part of that is, again, the attraction as it was, for, it has been for many years of our school system. But the issue there isn't so much the change, it's the result of the change. And the result of the change, as the citizens that come into those households versus the citizens' outflow, there's a net loss in the revenue per household and the revenue per person. That's not, again, not good or bad. It just is what it is. Um, and then there's been a, a continuing steady increase in the county population, about 1.6% a year, and a likewise uh, increase in the uh, school population, about 1.6% a year. Now, one of the things I learned over now my long career, which will come to a formal end, but not total end, um, is I learned early, I used to early, I, I did a lot of numbers at the Rouse Company because I was their risk manager. We had lots of losses, so I was trying to track how do you change them, how do you, how do you talk to the marketplace in terms of placing coverage. And in the early years, I was a pretty good spinner. Uh, I, I was a marketer. I could talk that. But I learned after two or three years, as I matured a bit, that I needed to understand what was driving the numbers so I could figure out, in my case, how to change those numbers versus trying to spin them because my spin got old uh, and the markets began to hear me uh, or at least recognize what I was doing. Um, watching how politics, and this is personal to a degree, but how politics and discussion of important issues has devolved in our nation, our state, and, and I think now seeping into local discussions I want to tell you I'm proud about the manner in which this committee has approached their charge. Uh, I've said it every year. It's one of my joys the last four years because it is a committee who is, uh, has left not just politics but everything out the, out the door and really focused on common sense and trying to come up with what we – recommendations and ideas that we think the county should be looking at. And as much as anything else, we've learned and we've been working it to, to do a better job at – educating our citizens so that they have information versus wants and feelings and desires. Um, we hope that citizens will read our report, which is counter to the manner in which a lot of information is thrown out on social media today. Uh, it's an 18-page report, and I've been told, and we've worked hard at it, that it's an easy read. We've certainly worked hard to achieve that, and, and we invite you all as council people to link us up with additional organizations so that we can continue to listen and to answer their questions relative to the report's findings and recommendations and have discussions. We've started that process. We had three or four meetings already, but we want to have more. Uh, and when we see social media out there, we want to respond to it not by throwing stuff at them, but by meeting with those groups and listening and trying to have that discussion. Uh, a better educated Howard County citizen is good for us all. Uh, for all elected officials, uh, for the county, and that's what we hope to do. We've sent the report out. We, uh, since it was such a good read, we uh, expect that you have read it and, and may have questions. And with that, I've got a group of really uh, 
good committee members, and there's a lot of good committee members that aren't here. Um, the committee was as active as I've ever seen it this year. It's been great. And uh, so we will turn it really over to you and try to respond to your questions. Good morning, and thank you all for your service and work on this. I did have a few questions, and I'll try to be efficient. We'll start with um, the notion that you made about the demographic shifts and how it relates to housing. So what I heard you say was that um, as we are aging, there will be an increase for services, and as um, the school system grows, there'll be a need for uh, uh, what have you, whatever related to school-aged children, um, and that those will potentially be uh, revenue challenges. I also heard you say that with the changing mix of housing, transitioning from uh, single family attached predominantly to more townhomes and multifamily, that that changes the revenue uh, stream. Is that, was that all accurate? I think it does, Dr. Ball, on a, on a per capita basis, so per, okay. per individual. So how, one, what's a potential demographic that you would see having a net uh, revenue positive, and two, what type of housing mix do you think would be uh, attractive to that demographic or relate to it? Well, I'd say two things. First of all, that's not our role. It's not our role to be prescriptive as to what development should be or shouldn't be. I would also say that relative to the changes that have been made in zoning, the opportunity for those single-family dwellings is a lot more restricted, and it's not because of any legislation in terms of APFO or anything, but it's more restricted just in the amount of land available for that type of development. So I think that it, it's not so much can we change something unless you opened up the West, which, you know, I don't think is going to happen. But, you know, that's the, the large amount of undeveloped land. That's where it is. And that's where the county's made the decision, uh, which is not, again, we don't get into telling the council or the county executive what to do relative to how to spend the money or changes like that. It's just on revenue and expenses. So I, uh, I guess I was more. I'm so trying just, to duck your question, but that's the reality. It kind of sounds a little bit like it. So what I heard was like a certain demographic is more challenging reven uh, with the revenue. What demographics are less challenging when it comes to revenue, or maybe net positives that you see? Uh, I'll start by answering that question. It is what it is. And it's no different than my, well, let me explain that to you. Okay. It's, it's, it's like I talked about dem numbers. The numbers are what the numbers are. The zoning is what the zoning is. If you wanted me to say, and I don't okay. think it has any uh, relevance to our report, that if you wanted the greatest revenue, you would have large McMansions with people of high revenue. So your per, per house revenue for income tax would be high. Your per house property tax based on valuations would be high. I'm not saying that's good for the county, but if you're answering your question in terms of what that would mean from, a, from a, just a pure like procedural or economic, that's what it would be. That doesn't say that's what we should do. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. no one's that's, suggesting that's that. What, that's what it would look like. And how do you anticipate that would relate to the increases as far as the schools? Because usually what I think of is people are going to, invest in those types of McMansions, usually they have, not all, not always, but oftentimes have kids that kind of relate to that. And so I'm just trying to understand those two points and how they're juxtaposed. Well, that's, that's a, good, a good question. What I would say, what we've seen so far, when we looked at the demographics and, uh, from the school system and from, doc, uh, from uh, Jeff Brunow, what we found out that about 60 plus percent of the new students in the schools were from resales of existing homes. So that a, a lower percentage was from the, from the new homes. Yes, if you built McMansions, I think there'd be more kids, but the reality is we're seeing that we're getting the largest segment of our new students from existing housing that's been resold with people coming into the county. And I would also add, Dr. Ball, that when you do the multifamily, multifamily tends to produce more school kids 
So yeah. those are the two pieces that are creating most of the school uh, increase in the school uh, population. Mr. Fox. So, uh, ooh, my mind's loud, actually louder. Um, <laughs> um, it, as far as you know, I guess the mix. I guess wouldn't commercial actually be? You know, we're talking about demographics, but as far as land use, wouldn't it be commercial that's actually going to give the county um, our best situation as far as net revenue, our net, uh, our, our yeah, yeah, net. Uh, Net taxes, I guess. Uh, Mr. Poignet, respond. Yeah, when we talked about that um, during the committee presentations, especially with uh, with Jeff's presentation, it clear that whatever we can do from a commercial development standpoint to try to boost um, commercial development will will help that revenue problem without having the same level of expenses. Right. So, so giving up commercial property for residential isn't necessarily a good thing from a from a financial perspective for the county. So just trying to answer from the perspective of how the committee looked at it and, and the way the committee looked at it was that it, whatever the ca county can do to, to boost commercial development would be would be good to increase revenues. So uh, so the, 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 I, would, I would assume then the things that you're doing to give it up and giving up that land would, would have the you know, inverse impact. But Greg, or council person. I, I, Greg is fine. So, the, yes. the challenge is that if you look at, for example, Gateway, where one of our recommendations is, is we need where that needs to be accelerated towards a master plan. I understand. That's I'm, mixed use. That I understand. So a lot of and, and downtown is mixed use because that's where most development is. Go I see it throughout the country. That's where development is going. And, and that's getting you commercial that may not otherwise be developed. And the key thing, just as we did in this plan, was to make sure that the commercial was getting done and getting done ahead of some of the plans for residential. But I'm talking about more in sort of you know, um, spot rezoning and other comp other things that happen in comp rezoning that takes away commercial land that has nothing to do with something like that. I would agree with you there. I, I, I think the one thing for all of us to recognize is there is a relationship between commercial, especially office building, right. and new employees and housing. There's an expectation that there's a relationship there. It isn't a zero-sum game. So if we don't have moderate increases in housing, it could have, I don't know if it will, but it could have impact on our commercial development. Yeah, it, it could. I mean, although you have people coming in from other, other places, just like we're currently, we leave to go to other places. <laughs> Mr. I mean, Matthews. So. Yeah, I just wanted to add a point. Just from my perspective of <clears throat> my background, commercial developments generally have a, have a lesser demand on public services also, and that's one of the benefits of higher commercial development. Yeah. All right, thank you. And then my other thing, question had to do with the, on the, going back to the demographics on the age side of things. I didn't hear, you know, you know as far as, you know, I guess increases in services, I heard Dr. Ball say you were talking about potential decreases in revenues. I guess the question is, while there might be things from a service standpoint that we may need to address, the question is, at that point, there are also not kids, the, the kid your ratio that's associated with that, that population where we have whatever we're putting in, whatever it is, 16,000, whatever per student, whatever the number is, um, the, you know, the, the types of services we're talking, I would assume, would not be at the same level it is for education. We don't address it specifically because I'm, an, I'm a young, old person, and, and so I want to be careful in saying that they're gonna, we're going to drain all the services. And, and I first time I did it three years ago when we first said that Mike Davis was all over me on the value of mature citizens. And right. I think there is value. Right. That, that, I would think so, too. That there is value to it. So I don't know what the net increased services from a social service, health, certainly Steve Snellgrove would say from a health standpoint, there'll be more more issues involved but I, I I'm not an expert to say what that number should be or is or no I understand but I just meant it, it, it's not just it, it shouldn't be assumed in the way you were saying and I guess it was also just by the way Dr. Ball had rephrased it you know and talking about the increased services you were talking decreased revenues that that would be a necessarily a bad thing and I guess I'm saying you know, my, from my opinion we had this discussion a little bit last month as well you know I think it's somewhat of a good thing I mean part of it Part of it is when you look at some of the other counties and, and their burden as far as um, on, on education, you know, they don't have the same student ratio, you know, as far as in the number of students per, pot, per capita that we do. And part of it is where you, whether you have, you know, people aging or whether because people are coming here, 
you know, aging in those other places or people coming here specifically for the schools, whether it's because of the multifamily, whatever the reason is, that it's a, it's a slightly different mix. And I would think having um, the the mature citizens, seasoned citizens, or uh, whatever whatever some of those who've had recent birthdays uh, would like to be called, um, <laughs> would be a positive, net positive. I, I think you're right. I think the challenge for us all in mature citizens, as we look at what, 65 or 70 percent of the households don't have children in the school system. The challenge is not, I, un, I, I understand well the investment and the importance of beyond myself to invest in education. I, I think if you look at the demographics, and I can't talk to Columbia and how every person, but the mature citizens <coughs> tend to get more inward relative to their cost and where things go. And I think that, I think that it's something we have to communicate, articulate, make an important part of our who we are, because I think that'll be one of the challenges to right. us. And just to clarify for Mr. Fox, it wasn't what Dr. Ball was saying. It was pages four and five of the report that say, while the county encourages aging in place, an increase of residents over the age of 65 presents new fiscal challenges. And then on the next page, it says, the aging population of the county is only one of our demographic challenges. So I was asking for clarification on that point, which Mr. Mm -hmm. Sachs um, expanded upon in his presentation. And, and I would think the challenge, the main challenge would be that we're just making sure that we're planning accordingly for what their needs are, whether that's actually a fiscal challenge or a challenge is, I guess, becomes the, is, is really the question. And I guess, are you guys saying it will be a fiscal challenge? Or just a challenge. We're to saying sure. it's a fiscal challenge from a right. revenue standpoint. A revenue. As, as, as Dr. Ball just read what we said, we were very careful because we don't know how to articulate or enumerate what the cost, if there's a cost increase. Mr. Saxon, everybody, I suspect that when we go into our budget discussions, we are in fact going to learn that there is also a an expense um, impact on it, um, conversations that I had at the opening of the new 50-plus center in Elkridge lead me to, um, to make that statement um, about the number of people that are needed in, the work in our workforce and then in the workforce to uh, meet the needs of our growing senior population. I think that, so Mr. Sachs, you and I share a similar place on the uh, continuum of life, let's put it that way. Um, I think that's the way I like to do it, Mr. Fox, <laughs> because we, we all sit someplace and, and you never know what's going to happen, right? And so, um, but I think that uh, Mr. Sachs and I have been very productive. We haven't needed a lot since our children finished with the school system. We've been um, happy to give to the community, but neither of us know at exactly what moment we're going to need services from the county. And that's really what's happening with my, my generation, right? The, um, the baby boomers who are, who are huge in this county because they're, that's how Columbia got started, right? And that's how Columbia has As grown. I always tell my uh, internist or internal medicine person that I, what I don't know is what worries me. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And we don't know when we're, when we're gonna know that. Um, so I think that as we look at a, this balloon of baby boomers, and just to be clear, I'm right at the beginning of it. I'm not in the middle or and I'm not at the end of it. Um, it's going to present um, challenges for um, services for seniors in the county. So. Madam Chair. All right. Absolutely, Ms. Dr. Ball. So I wanted to go into some of the uh, recommendations that you all had. So the first kind of relates to your projections on revenue. Do you recall what the dollar amount variance on your projection on revenue was last year? Yeah. Uh, so let's, let, me, uh, let me answer that or have someone answer that in a, a larger scale because we saw on social media the things thrown out in terms of our inability to project. And um, so let me, let me have Steve... Uh, point out, address that first, and then we can you can go into more detail. Um, so, yeah, last year I think the variance year over year from fiscal year um, 17 to to was about uh, 29 million dollars mm -hmm. in a variance. And uh, do you remember what it was the year before then? It was 59 million. Okay. 
and the breakdown of that variance in the year before uh, 59 million, about 12 was related to uh, technical accounting adjustment in something that we don't even look at in the committee related to the health fund. Um, it was about $12 million in fiscal year 16, and it was about $13 million in fiscal year 17. And then in fiscal year 16, the state had a $26 million overpayment of income tax to the county um, that drove a significant portion of that. So um, there were some slightly higher um, SDAT assessment projections that came out after the committee met uh, in both years that generated $8 million in fiscal year 16 and about uh, $7 million in fiscal year 17. And there was, I think, a sale of property? Yeah, one-time property sales proceeds of about $7 million for the county in fiscal year 16. So if the variance last year was about $29 million from what you projected and what the actual revenue was, and the year before that about $59 million, uh, have you accounted for potential uh, changes in this upcoming year? Because you... you Kind of paint a, a again another challenging year, and you know as Mr. Sachs kind of alluded to, you know we went through the recession, we had several challenging years. We're out of the recession. You're still predicting challenging years, but the variances up to date for the last couple of years don't necessarily reflect that. Well, uh, as I broke down, I think the the primary driver of those variances aren't anything that would have been expected by the committee through the through the analysis and a portion of. If we go back and look at last year's variance in particular, almost half of it was due to something that's just added in from an accounting standpoint. It's not something that the uh, committee looks at from a measurement of the of the projections. Um, and then going into this year's projections, as we were looking at um, the fiscal year 18 numbers as they were coming in, um, the committee was alerted to the need for some reductions uh, in last year's budget because of uh, lower than expected revenue collection. Um, so taking into account that piece of information was probably what led, well, is what led the committee to have a, a larger discussion around projecting revenue going forward. I, I, would, I would add, Dr. Ball, in two of the last four years, the actual revenue has been under what's been projected. And if you look at how we work on this, and maybe Dr. Clinch can, you might respond to, because how we look at this is based on a number of leading indicators that we look at. And to go back and second guess what we did when we have the same process each year doesn't, and I would say, doesn't serve any purpose. And, and you're asking the right questions, and I appreciate that. But what appeared in social media, the people who put that out, I respect and know and had every ability to ask those questions before spouting it out and creating an issue within the community relative to the process. That, I don't think, is helpful. I think that's why we want to en we're willing to enter into any discussions and meet with people to talk about that. I think I love social media. I get all my Duke news on social media. I don't think I want to get my... I get all my news. Duke news from you on social media, too. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Matthews. Uh, you want to talk about how we... How we before before you do that, I just wanted can I do a follow up to to that other part of it though, as far as on the the number. So, it also just to put it in perspective, I guess as a percentage of the budget, what that twenty nine and fifty nine were, as well as if those numbers, the same things that did change, came in the other way, those you know technical things that went the other way, not the property sale, but you know, property sale doesn't happen, technical stuff the other way, and the the dollars from the state becoming the you know the other direction. Then what would have happened? Which we have to give back, right? By the way, yeah, right, exactly. So, but if what that what that would have actually done the numbers? So both the percentage and so and the, the, as a percentage for fiscal year sixteen, it was just over five percent of the overall budget. For fiscal year uh, seventeen, it was right around a little under three percent of the overall budget. And I, I would say that the primary driver of those numbers is that big one-time number from the state. I mean, that's almost. 50% of what happened in fiscal year 16, if that number of, wouldn't have happened, it would have driven us to the, you know, to be almost, you know, where we need to be if you would take out the, the accounting adjustment for the health fund. I, I would also finally add that we hope that there is a small surplus because that's where PAYGO comes from. Right. And exactly. without that, exactly. we got a real problem on our infrastructure and roads and the other things that we typically have not done a great job as a county in, in addressing. 
difficult. I, what I what I was is is we look at three major indicators. We look at Moody's projections for Maryland and the country in terms of revenue growth, for personal income, and otherwise. We look at the state budget, what the state puts out, and then we look at the esteemed Dr. Clinch, who puts out a report. And it's looking at those three things. And by and large, we tend to cut the middle. Who could, who could that be? I'm sorry about that. I'll turn that off. So as Steve talked about, we, we look really at you know, the, the things that account for 80, 90 percent of revenue, which are the you know, property tax and income tax, and one-time things are in, you know, incredibly difficult to forecast, which is what, what Steve had talked about. Why not? So. so you made a recommendation of $75 million in GO bonds, which I found interesting for a few reasons. Number one, and I went back to... 2005, just so I could better understand the history, a recommendation of that low has never been requested. I also went back to 2005 on the approval. A rec uh, uh, approval that low has never happened. Help us understand why you would make a recommendation so low when it's so unlikely that it would be approved that low and that it's never been Asked. Usually we're around the 90 to 100. I think in 2005 was the lowest that I saw uh, was at 80 million, but the world has changed significantly since 2005. So can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, so as we, we, one of the focuses we've we've had over the past few years as we're as we're looking at the capital spend expenditures and especially the the general obligation bonds is not only the current year's needs and issuances. It's also the the unissued but authorized bond levels that the county has. Um, and so last year, the recommendation was $85 million um, from, a, from, from the committee to try to, you know, take into account what, what was being planned for the, for the courthouse with the P3, but also to, uh, to take into account as to what the, the use of the unissued but authorized bonds. And when we were looking at it this year, um, I think last year, 85 million was in the report. 96 million was what was authorized, but 132 million was what was issued. And the 132 million that was issued is because we were issuing bonds that we had previously authorized. And so, as we're looking at the at looking at those numbers, it's going to take a few years of maybe tightening the the reins on authorizations to try to get through the unissued yet authorized bonds and finish some projects that are within the within the pipeline and so with the remaining number i want to say it's about 250 million dollars of authorized and unissued bonds it's going to take a few years to finish those up to get the county to stay within the the, the boundaries that are out there for you know that the county has for debt service and debt limits and stuff like that so that's really where the recommendation came from it was let's work through the stuff we've already approved is that significantly higher than usual? The it's been moving down. Um, I think over the past few years, I'm assuming you're talking about the the 250 million. 250 million, yeah. And if you look at that in total, there that's the general obligation bonds. The county has somewhere in the magnitude of 800 million dollars worth of authorizations for different types of bonds. Um, that number for the um, authorized yet unissued has been going down, but it was $400 million a couple of years ago. And, so, we, and we, were, we were very concerned about that because of the um, just, you know, bond issuances take care, it has debt service, but the offset that, or the additional piece that comes along with it are the operating costs that come along with new buildings and new facilities. And so when you have revenue strains, spending strains, continued capital expenditures, all of those things together, that's where the recommendation came from. So if it went from 400 mm -hmm. million ish to 250 million ish, why is the concern raised up dramatically higher to make a re recommendation of, of 75 million? So it um, seems like we're going in the, the right direction. We are, and we want to continue to go in the right direction. But last year with that, with that issuance to, to issue $132 million was, was a big number and we, you know, it, ate up some of the 
unauthorized or authorized but yet unissued bonds, but it still was a large number. And you also reference the courthouse, but my understanding is that uh, the 75 excludes the courthouse and the P3, correct? It does. Okay. Dr. Ball, I had a follow up on, on your earlier part of your question. So, so if these are the trends we're trying to, to pull back on the amount of unauthorized, and there were some closing accounts that we weren't going to use or were already completed, but um, is in projecting out, are you, are you, are you zeroing in on an a annual level that's about right? Uh, by trying to pull in those numbers or? No, I think the focus that we, I think the, uh, the county has done a great job in, in, in the last few years of identifying projects in pipelines that haven't moved through. Are they going to continue to move through? Are we, are we reauthorizing bonds to go forth? So it's more in that planning process to make sure that, okay, here's what we have in um, authorized yet unissued. When are we going to be issuing those along the along that continuum to figure out okay what's the optimal amount and if if we've been issuing in that hundred to hundred and ten million dollar range on an annual basis of bonds, if seventy five million keeps you to be around that level right now for a couple of years and then work it out, then I think that's where we were as a committee up anybody else who wants to comment on that i I think I'll go back actually to rate wax back in nineteen ninety seven when I was first on this committee, I asked him a question because at that point, amazingly, everybody was questioning the school construction budget. Can you, can you believe that? Uh, <laughs> and, and I asked I'm Ray, sure have changed. <laughs> that's right. I asked Ray, I said, okay, so when you go before the council, and what kind of questions do you get? And they said, well, what's the impact on the budget? And I said, what do you tell And I asked Ray, what do you tell him? He said, there's none. And everybody goes on. And I said, the reason for that is because bonds are authorized, but they aren't used. It's downstream when the cost comes. So it was, an, it was an actually correct answer to the question, but it didn't help the council understand the impact. This committee started looking at the underauthorized bonds, and we had a, a fit because we couldn't make sense of it. And we started pushing hard on the county and, and stand, and they were very responsive to start getting back and looking at that stuff and seeing what didn't need because it's. I think, as Steve said, it's not what's authorized; it's what you spend in that year. That's what's going to impact the debt service. So, can I my question? Actually, sort of, Doctor Son. So, actually, I remember when we came on, you know, however many God, over a decade ago, and and one of the things uh, in the you know that we started pushing for in the budget was asking for like the the impact the annual impact of whatever the construct the capital project would be and that was both based off of operational things that you know that are there as well as the the as well as the debt service side of it i guess from a budget standpoint so i'm just asking dr sun so at what point you know you know, in the budget process, you know, knowing when the bonds are coming, when are we, you know, not on the issuance time, but, you know, as, as they were mentioning, um, you know, timing of all that, when, when, do we, when do we start budgeting that interest expense, you know, the, the, the principal interest expense into our budget for the, you know, for the project? Are, you know, are there some that we anticipate that we budget that we budget and then they don't get issued that year and they get issued the following year? How does, what's the exact timing on that? Yeah. Thank you for the question. That's very much to the point there. Well, uh, what we have been doing is we have been working with our departments um, and making a cash flow projections based on original authorized but unissued bond there. And we have been doing that practice more recently. So based on that, that's why uh, some of the debt service projections that included in the, the spending for the report uh, figures there uh, that's run by finance was has already factored that in. So in other words, it uh, looks like historical, as you know, a few years ago, the, there, are, there are some really high level of bond authorization. Some are still go through the pipeline. And based on that cash flow projection, it looks like in the next three years also, we're likely to absorb those historical ones, whatever is still left, while also add on those new authorizations on that. And after that period of time, more likely to go to a um, more manageable level of um, the actual debt services, which actually based on probably 90 to 100 million um, GEO a year. Because currently, we actually issue much more than that because of the historical piece are still going through the pipeline. But it should take a few more years, and we will go back to the regional level. So, so let, me ask, let me ask this, and I, I think we sort of had asked this last year a little bit of the various departments as far as even, you know, like one, 
getting thing projects cleaned up, which is part of how the numbers come down. It wasn't like things disappeared, disappeared. I mean, they just were things that needed to be cleaned off the books. But as far as in getting those projections, as far as when the dollars hit, because, for example, I can understand where you're coming from with the 75, but if we're issuing 95, but part of it is sometimes you have to have that authorization to be able to get a project going, but you still aren't going to, just like now, you're not going to spend it until whenever. I guess part of it ends up being it's not that it's just 75, it's the timing of the 75. Like it was all 75 that was going to be able to be issued this coming year on top of whatever else was coming, that would be a problem even, I would assume, versus if it's, you know, spread out over time. I just want to make sure I understand. Like, like last year where that was 85 and 132 were issued. Right. That was both For, existing, existing and, and it, right, exactly. And, and, and that could have all been 132 of old stuff and that whole 85 could be right. stuff that we haven't, haven't done. Well, and so, Dr. Sun, what is our hoped for bond issuance this year in FY18? I hope that he would answer that question first. He was getting ready to answer okay, that sorry. question. Sorry. Well, no, it, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's the it's continuum of question. what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, and, and I think one thing that it, it, the committee probably has struggled with over the years is that is the, that timing difference, right? It's you, you sit there and, you know, we, we – we, f we fund our bonds after we've, ex you know, we're replenishing as opposed to, okay, you know, I'm a banker. You want to build a project, let's fund the debt, we fund as we go, as opposed to, oh, we built this, now we're, re we're replenishing. So that timing difference helps the county from, a, from an interest, um, from a cash flow standpoint, although it, it makes, makes it a little harder to line up the two, the two buckets. That's a good question, though. I'd like you to answer your question. <laughs> right. So then, Dr. Sun, FY18, right, we, so we sat here last year talking to these folks about um, spending affordability. We authorized the 90. We authorized in the budget the 96, Correct. approximate, yeah. if I recall correctly. Yeah. Right. And, um, and so that 96 in FY18, what's the actual bond issuance for GO bonds that we are hoping to accomplish? two parts. So first, uh, during the spring, you knew we are going to issue another uh, bond on that. And that bond is not tied to, primarily not tied with the authorization of FY18, but previous several years, um, and based on the actual construction needs on that. During the spring, the bond for the GEO is likely to be somewhere between 140 to 150 million, because of the very reason we just talked about, because we are still addressed historical authorized bond. That's why I think part of the <laughs> drivers for the committee to be very conservative, to conservative because, or be prudent, maybe that's a better word to say, it, because even the current authorization level last a couple of years, as you can see, already pulled back to the extent possible and somewhere around the 90, 95 million most of the years here, but the actual issuance is higher than because of the very reason that previously there were still other higher level authorities haven't gone through the pipeline yet. Given time, which is actually based on the cash flow in the in next couple of years, it will eventually balance there. But currently, we are still actually at the higher level of assurance, which actually concerned us because, I guess the committee, because on uh, annual basis, your debt service is based on actual bond issued, right. not to the authorized. Right. And then that debt service goes forward, right? Yes. So if, in fact, we were looking at the concept of $96 million, and that would then go forward into the um, into this next budget that we'll be starting to take up. That's a very different amount of debt service that has right. to be factored in as a fixed charge. So mm -hmm. taking up our, the, the dollars that we have for um, funding anything else, right? We're, and so if okay. the difference between 96 and 140, 150 is significant. And when we think about it from a budget perspective, it, given that we've, authorized more than that in the past few years, it has a limiting impact on what we can do with the budget. Yes. It, it, it's why we've put so much attention on it, because one of the things that we always come back to is we look at borrowing and debt service relative to eating up the operating budget. Mm -hmm. So we look at it clearly from it's taking away. It's important because we're doing something that we think is important. But it also takes away from services for our citizens, takes away from the social services, takes away from education, takes away from whether it's mental health or opioids or whatever we're doing. That's how we think about it, and that's why we get sort of so focused on that, that we have to have more discipline relative to that, because it's a kick-the-can-down-the-road issue 
for future councils and for future executives that, that will be significant. Uh, well, on that, on that point, um, and I know you don't make necessary recommendations on what specifically to do, but relative to some processes, uh, multi-year planning and budgeting. Uh, I know we, we've worked uh, a little bit here to try and clear up, as, as Mr. Fox said, some of our CIP and, and cleaning out those projects, being more explicit as the impact of projects in out years, trying to be more realistic in the out year forecast. Sometimes we have a CIP this year of, you know, couple hundred million, but next year it's 700 million. And we, we know that that's not actually ever going to be funded, but uh, the way that the projects are budgeted. Any, any thoughts on or discussions about what what that might look like for a county or if you've come across other counties, or Dr. Clinch, if you've had this experience, other jurisdictions that are doing multi-year budgeting and, and, and planning at the at the sort of at the level as we do with the, the, the next uh, coming fiscal year. It's a good one when everybody's pointing at one person. So there you go, Dr. Clint. <laughs> we're, we're all pointing at each other. So, um, so, uh, yeah, multi-year planning, multi-year budgeting is essential. Uh, you know, Maryland does pretty well you know, with the spending affordability process to implement this you know, citizen. So there are places that do it better and places that do it far, far worse. So yes, multi-year budgeting would, would and taking into account how fiscal decisions today impact two, three, four years down the road is a best practice in budgeting and, you know, place, other places do do it, as I said, better. Some places, most places probably do it far worse. We, we did, that was a first year recommendation last year. And we said that, and we, the difficulty of it, because you have the school system, you have things that you don't control within that. But we said that's something we have to move toward, toward, towards. And when Holly came back, or Dr. Sun came back with the uh, plan, the first thing I would say, it's a J curve. Because you look out and you look out at the, at the deficit, and because we were concerned that we don't want to be surprised by a structural deficit, that all of a sudden we run into it. So we think there needs to be that discipline created, and that this was the first year. And when I looked at it, when Dr. Sun did her presentation, it was like, and your eyeballs widen, but realizing that that says that as you communicate out to the stakeholders, you start communicating the, the need to actually have real discipline and not to make it a J-curve each time because it doesn't do any good. I, I, a long, long time ago, back when, when Chamber and, and, and also on spending affordability, Dr. Cousins was head of construction. And he used to come there every year, and it was like, this is the last year we need the money. I was, I was, it was great. He had, he, he had my pitch when I was a young uh, marketer. And, and it was always, and I, when I asked, I asked Ray Wax that first year, I said, Ray, can you give us five years of the school project? And it wasn't just a school. It was the county that was allowing you to do that. If you don't force the discipline, I've been on, a, I was on the college board for 12 years. You're going to go after what your constituency wants, and you're going to work the system the way the system allows it to be worked. And that's what was happening. You looked at it every year. It was always this year, and it was nothing in the out years until it changed. And that's no longer... We, we all learn to play different games as we uh, get older. And if you, if you take a look at page, uh, the bottom of page 10 and the top of page 11 on the report, you'll see, you'll see information around the, the multi-year projections. Um, again, it was, it's more as a, a guideline just to see, based on what we've put in place or the things we have coming, this is what expenditures could look like. And if, you know, other growth and other types of things, this is what revenues could look like, not for anything other than to have an awareness. Sure. No, I think that, that that's essential, and, and, and I think you, uh, Mr. Sachs, you made the, the great point, is that a good portion of our budget is a little bit outside our control in terms of a lot of the considerations and thinking that goes into that portion of the budget, and uh, certainly the recommendation you've had, and you've had it in years past as well, and if I remember when I was on the spending affordability uh, years and years ago, it was a recommendation made there is, is to, to, to work more closely in the formulation stages to include those entities, particularly the, the education arms of, of the county, the school system. Um, you know, I think we're seeing a, a, a little bit of a trend toward that, but I, until it's sort of in lockstep, which schedule-wise, obviously, is not, not going to happen because they're, they're operating on a different schedule, but that is, uh, it's going to be a critical, a critical piece. Uh, I had another um, slightly different topic, but it sort of springs off the, this, this issue of the bonds uh, level, and, and I was... A uh, similar question on the 
the revenue growth projections uh, at 1.75. Could you elaborate a little bit more on some of the, the discussions that went on? And there was a, I think there was a vote taken on that one. Uh, I, was, I was curious what the vote was, if, you, if you're willing to share that. Uh, it, it, uh, was, I'd have public, to but. ask. Actually, Raul's not here because he that's, records it. But I think in that vote, it was largely to the 1.75. And it would, it would have surprised you who I was surprised by the people who went on that I was going to say, actually, there was only about two individuals on the committee that was there that day that did not vote for the 1.75. One yes. Is that because they wanted higher or lower? They, they, what, the other two wanted it to be higher. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, yeah, could curious. you just get a little bit more, more uh, background on and how, we, how you all got to the 1.75? I mean, it's, there's some of it in here, but I think it would be helpful. Good question. The biggest thing that I, speaking for just looking at the committee, is just all the uncertainties that are out there that the that the county is dealing with. Whether is the uh, the tax uh, tax reform at the federal level, what the general assembly is going to do with those dollars that are coming to the state of Maryland, inflation rates. Um, we also have seen that the decline in our personal income coming to the county, and so all those factors just left those those uncertainties. <clears throat> And it tied into us knowing that, yes, <clears throat> the, the budget office was predicting 2.2 uh, of our projected 2.2 percent. But given all those uncertainties, we just felt that uh, we need to be take a more conservative approach. And also we're looking at those factors that Stephen mentioned earlier where you have an aging demographic but a growing school population that's making pr pressure on the financial resources of this county. I guess I'm, I was wondering, because I, I noticed you mentioned uncertainty also in your recommendation. Are things more uncertain now than they were previous? Uh, the things that you talk about feels like they're always in states of flux. W what happens with the federal government? What happens with the state? What happens with uh, tax revenue? What's different about this? I'll, I'll let Dr. Clinch deal with that, but we don't always have the same president. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the uncertainty is at a couple levels. First and foremost, the economy was in recovery last year, but we didn't see that, re that recovery and income growth translate into county revenue growth. So we were afraid of getting another surprise next year that we predict things. And you know, we, we, we thought the regional economy would be hurt more by federal uncertainty last year, but it wasn't. But that's going to be coming down the line in terms of how the current budget crisis in Washington translates into federal spending. So it didn't happen last year, uh, but it is inevitable that, that some level of restraint in federal spending impacts the state and regional economy, which impacts employment, population growth, and all of those, and income, more most importantly, income growth here. So yes, uncertainties are, you know, always exist, but it, it, you know, it hasn't come yet, and it's likely to come from anybody who's watching Washington. And, and the other thing, Dr. Ball, one of the things that Dr. Clinch had mentioned, we're, we're near full employment, which means that's going to mute the growth. And in our county, we're at the top of that. We're 2.8 percent, I think it is. So it's really difficult for us to grow. And then you have the other legislation, different uncertainties, and it just, it, it was, uh, I was surprised by that mm -hmm. group. And, and it, it, I would say in, in reflecting, it reflects well on the incredibly broad participation of committee members in that discussion. Your comment earlier was uh, we have a different president. We don't always have the same president. We don't always have the same okay. president. I would say that's actually a daily occurrence right now as opposed to <laughs> a four-year cycle, but it's just. Probably better so, not to comment. <laughs> so, so just real quick, though. So you know, one of the things, so the county projecting 2.2, versus that, you know, do you see a problem with that, I guess, one, and then i got a couple of follow-ups to, to that. Do we see a problem? With, with, the, with the projected 2.2 percent. So when, when, the, when the committee was having the discussion, um, the, the focus around the 1.75 versus the 2.2 is that revenue and spending are interchangeable from that perspective. Um, and, and so we're talking about re revenue growth, but really what we're talking about is spending growth. And so the discussion was how can we plan for less spending growth during, that, during this period of time to, so that we have, if 
if money comes in, it would be better to be in a surplus than it would be to be to be planning and be in the same position we're in this year where we're looking for cuts. Okay, and, I, and, and the difference appears to be right now in the numbers, the amount that um, Dr. Sun is, is, is and may, maybe you guys took it into consideration as well, she has a portion of the, of the of the potential, I guess, windfall, whatever you want to call it, having to do with the federal tax law changes that would result from, you know, the state and then coming down to the county and us having, I think it was from, we were just in the bond rating, I think it was like taking about 25% of that number. Was that about what you were using? A little bit more. And that, that basically accounts about for what that difference is. And I wasn't sure if you guys had that in there and if otherwise our numbers were similar or you guys have that in there and are otherwise our numbers are higher. So we were using the same numbers when we were having our discussion. So we were using the projections that were coming from Dr. Sun in the county. And I would say, you know, there was, un of there the, was uncertainty. Of that, of that number coming from the increase coming the, from the, the tax the, law change. The, what we were presented was the 2.2, that this is what, the, this is what the, ex the expected revenue increase will be. But there is uncertainty in that number as we don't know if that was going to come down. I think there's beginning to be a little more certainty today than there was. So you got, a month was that ago. what you were potentially removing then? I, I, guess I think I'm just it works to out to be about the same number, but I, I think the focus of the committee when that number was put on was more to limit spending to a certain dollar amount than it was to to have a deeper discussion around the development of that two point two percent. Would anybody disagree with me on that? I, I would agree. And it was when I read it from sitting in the chair, I, I thought the committee was sending a message. I mean, that's it was a communication that you need to look at this. You need to, we all need to be serious about this and need to look at. And we also, you, you haven't hit our, but we put in revenue, uh, at least a couple rec revenue things, some that have not been done. Both of them haven't been done that we feel strongly that we, there's, we need more revenue in the county. Uh, based on the way we uh, collected at this point. One of, the, one of the things I think spent a lot of discussion, all of you know that 90% of the county's rev uh, general fund revenues come from either property tax or personal income tax. And we've seen the decline in, in both of those. There's moderate growth that's projected, and that was a concern of the committee also, is just our, primary, our two primary revenue sources the, the projected or the moderate growth or even the possible the decline in them. Right. And not my last one on this, and I know we can't bank on this this happening, but, you know, it, we wouldn't want to use it for projections, but I guess, when, you know, down the road and people are saying, well, this came in much higher. I, I huh? Use a pay go. I, I fully, right. Pay -go. But I'm, I'm not saying we should be bumping. I'm just more just want to get this group's, you know, feeling, you know, one of the things we, we didn't see some of those increases that you thought you might see was some of it potentially, you know, because this area, I remember through time, we've been hit heavily by the changes, everything having to do with capital gains taxes and everything, potentially people holding off on making some of those decisions until this year and that, that we're going to see them now, you know, going forward and that we might have a bump up before then stabilizing again. That's, that's, that's an appropriate question, and, and I'll say two things. One, I, I was at doing a presentation for the chamber board on Friday as I was losing my voice, and, and they had Peter Francho in after me, and I, was, I got to listen to, to the controller. And what he said was, to his surprise, first of all, to my surprise, that the tax uh, legislation, federal legislation, was having a more positive effect than he thought in the state and we'll see how that, that rolls out. The second part of your question deals with capital gains, and I would tell you from being an old person and being on this in 1997 and being here now, for this committee to ever bank on how people uh, do things I didn't ask you to bank on it. It's a slippery slope. Did not ask you to, I did not ask you to bank on it. It was just more of a, because I was saying, I don't think, I think it would be responsible for us. I, I was just that, wondering, just in general, your feeling about if that's part of the reason is people holding off? Why we didn't see the gains, and therefore but they were, would we they potentially, were and then potentially, will we see? Yeah. We don't know what that what that will be, especially since also those numbers are lower now too. But I'm, I'm just asking. Debt, there's no question. People were holding off because they thought a tax change was coming, and when we'll see a bump, because periodically, if you watch it, you're, that's where the bump comes, and you can't budget on that bump up or down. It, because Again, it's just, I didn't, you gotta, you gotta manage I didn't it. say to budget on it. I was just asking that question. <laughs> One other comment and, and, and Dr. Sun can can talk about this. The the piece that probably 
again, going back to almost similar discussion around how you, you approve bonds and they go through, the time lag that it takes to actually get the revenue from the state, the income tax revenue, you know, stuff that happened in the fourth quarter of last year, we're not going to see until fiscal year 2020. Um, so those types of things are that, that time lag, you know, you don't know where things are going to fall necessarily. The, the continued improvement in the stock market is going to defer any sort of capital gains potentially. And so, t yeah, some people tell you or not. Yeah. It's a, and and uh, you brought up revenue. Um, can, can we, is it right if we switch over revenue? Um, it would be okay, but Ms. Terrasa has been waiting, so yeah, if she can go forward. I'm happy for Ms. Terrasa. All right. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Ms. Terrasa. Thank you, Ms. Seeley. Um, so uh, there, there are several recommendations, uh, some some more specific than, than others. But uh, could you start? Just give me a quick quick overview on and sort of your, your your feelings on on revenue, particularly sources. You do talk about uh, the the ambulance uh, the ambulance fees. You talk about the the reallocation of the transfer tax. Do you appreciate your uh, plug to give us the authority to, to adjust it on a regular and appropriate basis? Uh, all for that. Um, uh, you, you did not speak to, uh, in terms of other, if you can speak to now some other revenue, potential revenue sources, uh, one of them is, I know you're trying to stay away from the politics of things, but from a, 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 a consideration right now at the state level, uh, giving us the op uh, ability to raise our school impact fee, which right now is, is sort of being considered, but may not actually pass this year. Um, Just throw that over to you. Yeah. Oops, let me first, uh, Allison will respond on the, uh, or talk, talk a little bit about the ambulance fee, which has moved from last year, we hope. You'll see. So the, um, the ambulance fee, we'd like to look at it as a recovery, a reimbursement from insurance companies. It's not really a charge to those that use it. We're the only county except for Calvert County, which doesn't have the fee in place. And Calvert actually just evaluated it in January of this year. Um, but they've been told, based on the way their government is, that they cannot charge that fee. So they're looking at some other, um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So they're looking at some other um, issues. But there's a whole report that came out about how they're struggling in their fire and EMS services department because of this issue. So can I ask a quick question? So um, this recovery isn't going to be a general fund revenue. It's going to go into the fire department. Uh, that that would that would be the county's decision. I think it, it should be a general fund. Okay. Right now, according to the county mm -hmm. code, I believe that that revenue source would probably have to be since the expenditures are going out of the fire, which is a special revenue fund. I would think the reimbursement would probably have to go back into it as well. So, which would mean, yeah, you could spend it for. EMS services or fire services or reduce the taxes, but I don't think you could do. You'd ha I, I guess you'd have to uh, look at the, how much that budget stressed, whether they yeah. need it or you, not, and look at it. You could adjust on the other just, side of the just equation. Exactly. Sure. My memory serves me. I think we'll, we'll probably soon you know, yeah. to, think, to that I think point. The, so it, I, but we're, I understand what you're saying. I, the, thing we, the thing that we saw was, and we've this is the fourth year this has been on. We've gone through, and, and, and John Butler has been terrific in, in giving us pushback on this to make sure that we do it in a way that citizens don't feel they can't use it, and that's real. Uh, we, think, we think with the, the county hired a consultant. They've gone and talked to all the others. Our view has been, one, it's, it's actually uh, contributing to our counties around us to their competitive thing because they're all on the regional basis of way uh, health care is priced. Uh, and the thing I, I mentioned to John when he was there, that, you know, it's, again, nothing's a zero-sum game. If we get three to five million and you guys figure out how that goes, but we have lots of needs in the county. So the concern that somebody may not use it when they should, we'll do a really good job, and they've dealt with it in other counties, to communicate and know that no one's getting done. This isn't an individual thing. But at the same time, that money is used for people who have real needs in the county. And so I think, you know, I, I think we need to look at sources where there's a correlation with the use. And the insurance companies have already paid. You've already paid right, the insurance right. companies. It's not like they're going to charge you more money. They've already built it into their premiums for it. So that's why we thought that one was I, I, I guess I guess two questions. Um, you know, one, did you look 
you know, and do you, did you get a study at this point? Maybe it's in here, but as far as what they are charging in each of the other jurisdictions, one, and then two, I guess, you know, if we are, do look at it, this is not for you guys, but just the county, whatever, is just to make sure that it's at a, at a rate that will be actually fully covered by insurance companies because you do run into the situation that in certain jurisdictions where they put fees above what will actually get covered. And so that if you do that, then that does present the problem of people not potentially not using it too. Yeah, so I know in, in the county they're evaluating the fees here. Um, when I did some research, some other counties, like Baltimore County, I think off the top of my head, they had fees of $500 for certain ambulance services. Um, if insurance did not cover all of it, they had payment plans and options for people. That would, that, would, that would concern me. That, guess, that was certain counties. So, right. So, so, and I guess that would be my, so that, my recommendation is, is make sure that we understand what's a typical reimbursable rate for the area is and not to exceed that number and yeah. whatever we set. I, yeah, Greg, our discussions yeah. w have been that we should not get more than we get from the insurance company, yeah. that they should be a recovery, and that the fee schedule would be, I would imagine, with a consultant. That's very prescriptive getting it, but with a consultant, to be looking at the insurance company reimbursements and tracking with it so that if you're going to outside the county, it'd be a different rate than if you're going to in the county. That, that's the details that we believe in Howard County we're smart enough to figure out. Right, so my, my original question was also other sorts of revenues. So we have tra transfer tax was a recommendation that you made, if I read this correctly, an increase. I'll, I'll take and, the transfer taxes. And then, and, well, and then, and then just uh, other, uh, other areas. Okay. I'm just looking through my notes here to make sure I didn't miss any. But, but if you can touch on anything else. Yeah, the, the transfer tax is something, again, we've recommended. And, and you'll see the language is a bit stronger this year. Because our perspective to the county executive was he needs to talk to you guys and we need to get something started relative to the whole issue of managing our own finances. We know that Council Chair Sigety would take that down and understand that when she gets to Annapolis. Uh, but it's, it's important because, you know, what you actually uh, put as a bill, I think, last year to make changes got killed down there. And you guys and the county executive are responsible for the finances of this county. And it doesn't make sense to us that that should be controlled in any way, shape, or form uh, by the uh, wonderful delegates and senators. But that's, we don't see that as their role. So that's, that's the first thing. On the transfer tax, again, we, we, we recommend this again because we believe there's a correlation now, while we're not saying put that into capital for the schools, we're leaving the county to figure out which bucket to put it in. It's basically when you look at that and what it means in terms of capital spending on it, either on a geo borrowing or on a cash basis, it's not insignificant. And we believe uh, that there's a correlation when I said there's 60 to 62 percent of the new kids in the schools are relative to uh, resales then it seems to make sense that, that, that that should be something that a new person is paying for, just like on AFO, a new home is paying for it. It seems like there's some kind of balance there in some way, shape, or form. Um, so that's, that's where that comes from. The issue relative to uh, the, the recommendation, not just that you go to the state and have a nice conversation with our, with our uh, group down there, but it's also that this is looked at, and you ran up against it. I talked to Ed Case Meyer when you had you wanted the stormwater remediation, and you, and which is really for the western part of the county is a lot of where that money was going to go. But the farmers went down and said, "No, we've got other things we may want to do with that large balance that we're going to see in 2021, 22." And our perspective is that's not an annuity for any of one of the four users. That, like in business, and we're a county, but it's it's a large business. That the groups that are getting that money, and you've got education, parks and recreation, fire department, and, and, and the uh, uh, ag preservation, they need to compete for that periodically and compete that based on sources and uses. It shouldn't, it's not something that is put in there and that's forever. That's our opinion. And that we're not saying it's our role, but that we think the county executive should appoint a group to look at that, a wide range of stakeholders, to look at that and, and then make that recommendation every four years, every five years, whatever is decided. And that's been our consistent recommendation. We think it's a good one. Your other question 
is what other sources? Well, you know, there's only one other major source, and that's and that's you can't do anything on the income tax, and it's and, and we're the highest at the income tax, and at the property tax, I've been chastised. We're not at the highest. We're just almost at the highest. And so when we, <laughs> looked at, when we looked at any tax increases in the past years, we had a chart. We looked at every tax that goes to citizens, and we looked at the burden of Howard County citizens, and we looked at each of those taxes relative to the burden mostly of our surrounding counties, because the surrounding counties is who we compete with economically, and we just spent a lot, good deal of time asking questions on the importance of commercial growth. So that's the people that look at that more than an individual citizen coming to live here. And so we're very sensitive to that. We understand there's politics for, you know, I think we talked about our job is not policy. When you guys make decisions on taxes and things that are outside of it, that's policy. Our job is to look at the numbers and be sensitive to if we're doing something one place, is there an unintended consequence somewhere else? You have a hard job. The county executive has a hard job. Given what we see in terms of revenue stream and given what we see in, in use demand. And, and education being a big piece of it, but it's not just education, it's other really important requests for services within parts of the county. It's a tough job. That's why your salary just got increased, right? So anyway, th does that answer your question, John? It does, thank you very much. Just, uh, you've answered a lot of my questions um, through my colleagues, but I had a question about this recommendation regarding APFO, and I'm trying to reconcile that with something you said earlier, which was um, what, I, what I thought you were saying was that additional residential, if it was seniors, people with multifamily housing, people with kids, was a net negative. Was I, did I? I'm sorry. I'm, that it was I'm, a straight in financial. Let me, I'm, I'm, no can address AFO, but I'll, I'll respond specifically to that question okay, because sure. I don't think, I, I, it was Dr. Ball's question, and I don't think I said it was negative, I just said if you have more multifamily and single family detached, as those homes come in, and that's what we have for land development available, that's why that's happening, when that comes well, in, yeah. you, you have a higher, probably a higher number of kids, but I don't know, that go to school system, but what you do have is essentially the occupants of those assets have a lower revenue per capita, okay? So that means less personal income tax, and those assets, okay, have uh, a lower value, okay? A, a townhouse has a lower value than a large home, so you have less property tax. Now you have more of them, so that it's, it, some of it's, it's relative, but that's, I was just looking at pure, higher costs. pure numbers. Just a pure, you know, I, I understand. I understand that. But then you said, I thought, I thought what I understood you say is that then there's a higher. There's a higher cost if there's more students in there. And you tend or to. seniors well, we've been who told, are using other services. I thought that was the conversation. No, the, no, that was a separate discussion on seniors. The question in terms of uh, residential occupancies on new construction, uh, if you have multifamily, we're told there's more students that come into multifamily that go into the school system, so there's a higher cost. And there's probably a higher churn on that, so you, you don't, like, lose them. A higher cost and lower revenue. And, and when you meant churn? I'm not saying higher cost, it's just a cost because they're going into the school system, so I that's... You just said higher cost, but okay. But, well, I apologize. Okay. Okay. Higher cost. They, they go into the school system, and adding, if you have more kids in the school system, that increases their cost. It's just and 10,000 some per student. I just want to follow up. So when, when you said churn, so you're saying, talking about once the people no longer have the kids because if it's, you know, rental or whatever it might be, they, they're, are they moving on to wherever versus if they, if somebody had bought a home, they may stay even for years after they've had their kids go through the school system. Is that part of what you were saying as far as the churn? I just want to make sure. I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying the churn is Purely the net of when someone leaves the county, the revenue they take with them, and if you look at the net of when someone's coming in, but based on the development, that we have a lower average development on that net net. We're, our, 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 listen, our average per capita income is incredible. It's probably, I think I just heard, is $120,000. So it's not looking at today. 
It's trying to look at where we're heading based on the demographics. Well, I, I didn't know uh, Councilwoman Terraza was there. Another question, question related to the uh, AFO. Actually, had to do with if we're talking about the cost exceeding the revenue, which it sounds like you're not saying no. Well, let, I think. I think if Milton responds on what, how, I think it's important that you understand how the APFO recommendation came up because that's also received a lot of good attention. Yeah. Just to clarify, Steve is saying that you're going to have a, your, your cost related per capita will be greater than the revenue you're going to get per capita when you're using um, multifamily or, or uh, semi detached housing versus when you have detached housing. That's what we were being told by the demographic information that we've been provided. So yes, your your revenue per unit will be less than your, tech, it could be less than your cost per unit. But it was, and more like, sorry, I was going to say it will though depend on the cost per unit yeah. because we are anticipating, well, we have seen significant um, rents, we've seen, um, right, Townhouses are no longer um, $180,000, mm -hmm. um, and the the larger homes that are still can be built in the western part of the county are significantly more than they ever have been before. Yeah. So, so it becomes relative, right? And then the cost of the uh, the cost of services against that. And I think that um, when we think about Howard County, and I guess Steve, you can. When we think about Howard County, we're a small county. And one of the first things that you said is basically we're a maturing county and we are looking at, you know, where, how are we going to mature? Well, and so as a small county with very little, um, very little left, um, unless we may, unless future councils and future county executives make significant changes, we, um, we are, uh, we will become more expensive if we main, it, as we maintain you know, if we maintain services, I guess, if we maintain a quality of life, people are going to want to come here. And with a small county without the, the land resources that others have, that that would, in fact, I would think, impact um, the, uh, the cost for people coming here, which then would ameliorate the expenses that, they, that, that we would have, the, the, the amount of money we would have to expend against, against their incomes and against their property taxes for the services. Am I crazy? No, I, you're not crazy. Um, okay. You, but other factors, and Dr. Clinch could talk about this probably much more eloquently than I can because I'm not an economist, but other factors um, would come into play as to whether or not we would be able to see those increases in revenue related to market dynamics changing. Sure. But yes, the less well, land you have, you would think property values go up, it would then make it more difficult for people to move into the county. So it would, we would probably be other, creating other programs to, to make sure that we were serving our full population. I think all I really wanted to say in that little bit of dialogue was that it's not as simple as the set of numbers that, no. you, that you were presenting to it's, us. It's, di it's like in most things with the economy, it's dynamic. Right. Right. So I guess in light of that, I was, I was somewhat, um, especially since you're sort of staying away from policy, interested in this recommendation because it sounds like what you're saying is that limited housing drives up prices, drives up property tax, and reduces the additional costs that we have in multifamily housing. So I'm trying to understand what this recommendation is about. You're talking about the AFO? Oh, oh. Well, the, recon the recommendation that the, um, the committee is putting forward is it, more or less that we, there's legislation that was passed related to the AFO. Right now we're saying that there's economic and financial fiscal impacts that we're not fully aware of going forward. And we're, our emphasis is on that we really need to have a study done to really explore what those are. Because as we said earlier, this legislation is, can, ha, can, and I emphasize can, have an impact plus a, or a positive or negative on our number one revenue source, which is our property tax. And so that's a concern that we have. It also, one of the things that's stated in here is that 
in my understanding of the legislation that is focused on trying to curtail new residential development where 62 percent of the resales exist and it's where it seems like when it comes to student enrollment that's where the enrollment is is picking up from the resales as opposed to new residential development so big picture we just need there's more information we need when it comes to the the economic and physical impacts of AFO going forward it's very beneficial to have that information because now the county is getting more and more into multi-year budget projections and we need those numbers if I might might add to that as things have mis been actually misrepresented quite a bit but we're neutral we don't have an opinion on that, fellow <laughs> as a committee. We aren't. We just need to know what the numbers, numbers are. It, it's, it seems realistic to me that you have a large piece of legislation that has the potential, plus or minus, or nothing, to impact the budget and the, the revenue sources and expenses of the county. And for us to do our charge, which is to do two things, to project what the revenues are going to be and project what the spending should be, and then the out years, that how in the hell can we do that without having detailed information that is comprehensive? Not the way, you know, I know you, you saw something relative to uh, the legislation that, that, that passed from, from EDA, and we don't have an opinion on that one way or the other. We just think it needs to be comprehensive, that there's enough talent within the county to come up with an RFP to get a comprehensive study on the impact of this long term, looking at the demographics, is looking at everything, so that you all can make, if there needs to be an adjustment, that's up to you. But from our standpoint, we just want to know what it means to us relative to what we're recommending to the county executive. Beginning and end. Okay, any more questions? Yes. So I don't think that that sounds completely unreasonable. Um, I guess I'm trying to understand the timing and focus of this recommendation at this point because we've been talking about APFO for four years. And at this point, last year, the bill was about to be filed. So why wasn't there this recommendation and this um, concern about the study so that we can fully understand the impl implications until after the bill has already been passed? Well, to be sim simply answered, we weren't following it at, at that point. It was a piece of legislation in process. We weren't, we weren't following it. Um, I mean, the committee met for like a year. They can, it met for a year. I understand it was a pleasant committee. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Ball. The, and I, I just Mr. don't see where Ms. we would Mr. be involved Sachs, in, in. Dr. Ball in, and Mr. Sachs, yeah. I think we're not going to have this conversation. I hate to, I, I, there are parts of me that hate to put it off, but the reality is, from my perspective, we have, we now have new law in the county, and it's um, reasonable to, for next year, next year's spending affordability committee to have, again, information. So I, yeah, why? Well, I mean, that's uh, no. true of a lot of legislation. Well, certainly it is, and I think and that they have come to us. Why this one is has popped out at this time, as Dr. Bott was saying, sort of the timing of this. We have we passed believe, lots of legislation that impacts the. And this I, was a and huge I, conversation last year. I'm. I, it and was. The administration but, was certainly well aware. Well, let me and ask so this, can so. I just let me just stop? All right, we're going to stop this conversation because we're talking about what happened before. Right. We can't go back to what happened before. We can take where we are at the moment and be able to move forward with, with that. They're asking for the, something that will help them do a job in the future and information that could make, could impact um, decisions that other people make in the future. I think that it is important for us to recognize a decision was made and Based on that decision, there's potentially new information, and leave it at that instead of going back and talking about why. So we're not going to talk about why. Are there any other questions for the Spending Affordability Committee? Content-wise, I'll give you a second. I think yep. it's clear that there are no more questions. <laughs> no, I think that's not true. Uh, I guess just one, one, one small one, if you will, Sigurdi, and, that, and that's relative to the recommendation on uh, on this task force. 
uh, roll to the, to the every four years uh, for reviewing the transfer tax revenues distribution. Um, did you go? It's it's a general recommendation. I, I, I'm sorry, it's page seven. Uh, I like the recommendation. I think it's a great idea. The question is, is uh, did you give it? Did you? There's more detail as to how you think the, you know, in terms of timing. Is it something that should be done? Uh, you know, in the you know at the beginning of a, a new uh, council administration term, in the middle, uh, at the end, like uh, where we are now. Any, any thoughts and. In about types of membership. Tax? Yeah. Well, no. In ter terms of the, the convening a county task, for, yeah, reviewing. I don't must even consider a, a broader scope potentially, but but the idea fundamentally is is a good one. I, I think, Councilman, we looked at it from a standpoint of it should be at least every four to five years, and, and that mm -hmm. we didn't say when it starts. We think it needs, it should be done now. Mm -hmm. From a standpoint of it's not been done in many many years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's. That would be our, our recommendation, okay. as it has been for the past several years. This year, we just tried to use a little bit stronger language to sure. say we think the county executive needs to take some leadership in this. It, it's something that should be done collectively with the council because it affects you, you, you both bodies and should be done that way. And you volunteered to lead the task force? <laughs> no. I'm an old guy. So. <laughs> you you have, you're going to have a lot of time in 18 days. Um. <laughs> Uh, oh, Chair, I I'd like to uh, you know, close and make one statement because, because we got into this thing on APFO, which I'm not going to go back to, but I, but it, 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 I want to make sure that it's clear. This committee, because I saw some things in social media, this committee is appointed by the county executive. He also goes to you all and asks for one uh, citizen, and, and as Jen gave me a great one that, you know, that uh, uh, that she had done for a number of years. It's important that they're in there. When I came on, we looked at, I think there's four or five that were carried over from uh, count, count, uh, County Executive Kittleman's. Ed was one of those. You mean Allman? Allman. Allman. They I sound the same. The county they sound the same. They all look alike to me. Yeah, short name, uh, long name. But, uh, but, but from Ken Allman. The people that I recommended to the county executive that he brought that, that he bring in were people that I had and I'm an independent had no idea what they were what I looked at was diversity in skill sets diversity in where they came from in the community so that we would have that collectively so when I see things that impose me that infer this is this is this is not and I especially with AFO county executive has never said one word to this chair and if he had, you wouldn't be looking at him. And this group has been an independent body. This is the committee's recommendations for good or bad. And whatever we did last year on a piece of legislation that wasn't, wasn't passed, if that's a mistake, that's our mistake. We'll own, we'll own up to that we should have been clairvoyant. But we didn't. What we have is a, is a report based on the information we saw this year that we think deserves discussion and consideration within the county. Okay, so, so um, unless, well, I just along questions. those lines, I just want to, so if you're going to look at AFO and you're going to look at transfer tax, are you also recommending, and maybe you have here, looking at the property tax rate? It, it seems to me like that's the other piece of that. That's other, a, that, I like think, that we think stool, the property so tax is a, as I said before, is a policy issue. That we, we looked at that, and we looked at it relative, I think I gave the response before that we looked at every tax. Right. Uh, council council person we looked at every tax and we looked at the income tax and this and the uh, property tax and we were way up in on the income tax we were the highest in the state at the property tax we were one of the top three in this I think believe it's three in the state in property tax so we looked at those and said in terms of being able to attract commercial business not residential but commercial business which is important an important strategy that that would not be a good move because those are the people that would look at that and that's what we didn't recommend it. That doesn't mean that the county executive can't do that as when we've recommended spending or recommended borrowing, it's a recommendation. Uh, I might add that in every time I've been on there, the county executive has always spent more than we recommended or borrowed more than we recommended, but that's our job is to give advice. We have no authority. And your advice is not necessarily to study that one. Our advice, we made no recommendation on property taxes. We put in there a comment on it that it's one of the options for revenue growth. 
and we think that's an appropriate comment. Mr. Fox, you get the last word. <laughs> last last question. Um, no, so you know, in one case, there is now for you know one of the ones that's been in the last couple of years. We have legislation in front of us, um, and that has to do with the public safety overtime cost and. And I guess, have you guys reviewed the legislation and are you guys comfortable with that legislation or any thoughts on that legislation? And I know you're trying to say, you know, not you know, political, but is it addressing things the way you would re are expecting them to be addressed? Steve? No, we voted that legislation. Uh, do, we, do we actually, do, are we, we finalized? Oh, yeah. Or, or, yes. or, or, that's right. We, we actually voted. Right. But did, what was your, did we the solve that the with that? The Sorry. discussion around from, yes. from the committee's perspective was just to make sure that with the legislation that the fees were implemented, that they are in the budget, and that there are the recovery costs associated with. Are, are with you the comfortable overtime? with what we did, or what was done? You know, what was proposed to us, and what we did. Sorry, in the wording of it, but yes. Yeah. Uh, are, we, I, are we comfortable? Ultimately, I, I and I'll be honest. I don't know the specifics on those numbers, but ultimately, we believe that we should move towards recovering the overtime costs. Okay. However, that's done. Can, I'm sorry. Can I follow up on, on that specifically? I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to offer one clarification. You voted on establishing the permit fees. Right. And you approved an application fee. You have not yet taken up what the permit fees will be. We anticipate getting that from the, the budget, administration budget, with the budget. Right. So which, in which terms is of those details, we've seen, that hasn't We've seen some, I guess, anticipated things. So, If you keep doing that, you can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> But, that, but that's where the discussion was, that yes. the right. fees are appropriate sure. for recovery. Well, yes. at the time right. that Chief Gardner presented the information right. from the right. totals that were used in the past few years. Right. right. And, I, and I would imagine, this is to you, Dr. Sun, that, that as this is implemented, whatever we end up voting, that, that there will be a review at some period of year to see if we're actually where that is in the performance. And then perhaps right. in next year's, I'm looking at you, even though you may or may not be here for the however many years consecutively. Well, uh, Mr. But, but uh, that, that, uh, Mr. <laughs> that, that would be a, a consideration of the next spending affordability. Right. Right. And, and Mr. Weinstein, I, I believe that we um, passed the legislation when we did so that we could actually look at fees as part of the budget. No, I understand, yeah, but so I'm saying that so next year up. they can look at it in terms of the performance against, uh, yes. against the, the, yeah. the actual thing. Indeed. Uh, uh, Mr. Glenn Denning, go yes, ahead. Yes, and add to that. When the fee structure comes down, I believe the legislation does say it is to fully recover the costs associated. So when the fee structure comes down to us at budget time, we'll certainly be looking to make sure that there's some kind of rationale for that fee that covers the basis to make sure it mm -hmm. is recovering all the expenses. That would make okay. the committee happy. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. It was a good conversation this morning, Mr. Sachs. Thank you. Thank Members you of the um, and, Spending and Affordability Committee, thank you very much for um, time and effort. And we, we appreciate your service. And uh, we, we'll get this. Somebody will get to see John next year. But yeah. we appreciate the service of uh, the four council persons who are uh, going to be uh, leaving the council after 12 years. And uh, thank you for your service. Thank you. Madam Chair, can I just express my appreciation? <laughs> thank you very much. I just want to take out the opportunity um, to thank Steve for his uh, leadership and also everybody around the table as well as uh, every member of the Spanish Photo Committee. I've been sitting and observing the committee in the past few years. I was extremely impressed by the collective wisdom and also the willingness for folks to put aside their own personal preference to work together with each other and using dialogue um, to look at the facts and come up with consensus based on facts there. So it's of extremely value to not only elected officials for decision making, but also kind of help me feel like that's, that's what makes the committee strong, but also make our community strong, that the way we were, we were able to work together. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sun. Although, don't leave. You're next. <laughs> I was like, what?
that didn't seem like 40 minutes. It wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> it, was an, it was a it's good long hour. discussion. Do you need to stretch a little bit before I start? <laughs> well, no, not one of us. Not, not. Okay. So, um, why don't you begin and um, our other two colleagues will be back momentarily. Yeah. Not to worry, it will get done. I think Jeff is the one who does it because he's tall. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Sun, why don't okay. you begin for us? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so first, quickly, uh, in response to one of the questions of the um, county council last time is about the county, how does the county compare to state, statewide uh, um, impact in terms of the, um, the potential impact from the federal tax law change on that? Mm -hmm. So we reached out to the state controls office. In the beginning, they didn't have the breakdown. But last week, they actually was able to do something uh, for their computer simulation. And it, the number just come up, actually. Uh, a few days ago. So based on their new model, which actually they modified the assumptions a little bit, the statewide, um, the counties in terms of the state and local tax impact is about 71% not impact. So for Howard County, that's about uh, 60, 67%. So slightly difference, but not that significant. And in terms of people who actually um, kind of benefit from the state and local tax, not the state wow is about 6% percent power county is slightly higher at 7%. And also in terms of those actually end up likely paying a little bit more um, for state and local tax, the state wow average is 22% and county is 26%. So in general, we are have a slightly higher percentage of people paying more, but it's not that significant difference. Did you provide us with those numbers? I no, no, no. We just got that from okay. from the state Could on you that. Yeah, share those can, with us. Yeah, we can provide you. And, and but they don't have really the detail about by different right. uh, um, different category. brackets on okay, that. That, that, that they have question. statewide total, but doesn't doesn't have the county breakdown for will, that. Will but they, we were able to get to the at least the percentage from that. Are they preparing that uh, breakdown by income brackets? They at have the state wild. But are they doing it? Not, they, not county they wild. Are not I actually sent them an email over the weekend to see whether they can have that for the county, okay. but at this point they don't have it. And based on the data that you have, is that something that we can do here locally or? Sorry. No, no I already, I already asked the them to whether they could get that. Right. No, I asked you, you that. I know you asked yeah. them if they could do that. I'm, my question no, is I if they say I no, thank you. They have, uh, yeah. It's pretty They've complex got because sure. they now use assumption of. Um, Assuming 100% of people make the right choice to minimize sure. their their gotcha. <laughs> tax okay. benefit, and they, mm -hmm. I don't have all those details. Okay, uh, again, so 67% of Howard Countyans are not impacted or, or positively yeah, impacted. The, okay, the percentage of people not impacted um, is the statewide is 71%. We are 67%. Mm -hmm. so, that's so the majority of folks not impact, but for the the rest of them. Uh, is either paying more or paying less. Okay, and can you go through those numbers real quickly again? I thought maybe they were written, the, the benefit and the... the for those uh, benefit, mm -hmm. and by the way, because of rounding, there's a no, number doesn't add you exactly 100%. Sure. I think it's missed by one percentage point. Those uh, are likely to pay less. Statewide average is 6%, the county is 7%. Mm -hmm. And those likely to pay more the statewide is 22%, countywide is 26%. So. But again, these are based on computer simulation, and consumer choice could make them actually fall into a different um, sure. category. And also depending on what's going to happen in the General Assembly, then that's going to maybe change completely what's the final results as well. So these are just, you know, it's a scientific way, but not necessarily reflect the true final results. That's that's going to impact us. And as, as uh, we mentioned earlier, that if, um, if the full amount could be materialized, the county could have um, probably 9 to $10 million at the maximum. But depending on what General Assembly happened, we might materially a portion of that. That's currently in our own budget office projection. We're affecting about $4 million potential net gains out of that. But obviously, that's depending on what's the final results from the General Assembly. Yeah. And the, 
and the um, what you're talking to us now about in terms of un uh, numbers is based on the um, the state just uh, doing nothing, right? Correct. Right. Correct. So. Based on what we saw come out of yes. Based budget on state and tax doing, doing last nothing. week, yes, um, their change, but to their um, recommendation to hold on to half of the windfall, right. will change these numbers a little bit potentially, yes. right? Yes. But if but based on their recommendation, should it should it find favor and make it all the way through the general assembly, what you're saying is, I think what I heard is basically the four million that you are. Thinking will come one time mm -hmm. would be represented by that recommendation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And in reality, that formula can reality, be higher or lower. <laughs> Correct. Right. So the the nine mil, nine to ten million was based on doing nothing at this point, but just letting the the, yes. the federal tax um, law filter its way through Howard through the the state and then through the county. Right. Um, but we know that that was too likely to generate about a $400 million windfall to the county. Mm -hmm. And what we heard was $200 million last week, which would then would cut that basically in half. Right. Yeah. Okay. What did you say about one? Th I thought you said something about that being one time. Being what? I thought I, thought I heard you say that was one time. No. Okay. If, if that's what you heard, that is not what Okay. I, so then, but for... So if they're going to hold on to half of the revenue, how does that impact, how would that impact us? Because I only factor in like a 40-ish percentage, like a 30, 30 to 40 percent. So, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Because in my current projection, I think I, well, about 40 percent of what could happen. So I think I had just part of that. Again, it's educated. It's not even educated. It's a guess. So it depending on what will finally happen at General Assembly. Obviously, the General Assembly has ability to take away everything or keep some part of that. What they will end up doing may end up making my number higher or lower than what could happen. What are you hearing on MAKO there? What are, you, are you hearing anything or where are they taking a stand on it? Or They have. I don't. I've got to look back at my notes on that, but I, I mean, I, I don't recall right now. Okay. I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, look, okay. any conversations I've heard, obviously, just sort of off the record were yeah, I mean, they're, they're having a hard time putting a scalpel to it because, because of the so com we, complexity right. of the tax issues. Yeah. I mean, it's just so uh, whether so, or not they come right. up with something. And know. since it impacts different counties. Differently, yeah. differently. Right. I think that makes it a more tough, tougher. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I believe they're staying out of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not guess, a betting person, but yeah. But and, and, I guess and obviously I don't think it has the <laughs> it has implication in both ends yeah. on that. If the state general assembly extend more of this, uh, obviously it benefit taxpayers directly. At the same time, then some of the Revenue where county actually have to support service will be impacted. Then we have to find other ways to make it work. So, it's so under the current end. legislation, is there some proposal that you see as reducing our revenue? I think the general general some there are different legislative flying right, around, but and I'm I mean, sure there will be more coming out. I, I, I'm not a position to guess what will be the right. But you guys have legislative results. folks, I'm sure, that are following that legislation. No. I mean, it would. It's uh, Oh no! I guess what I was saying is that are we following the legislation on the state level to know that whether there's proposed state legislation on the sort of on the federal tax issue that would harm us, that would cause us to have less revenue. I understand that the impact on the residents, but on our and for the county. Do we not have anybody following that on the county level? What was the question? Well, I know we may have somebody, but doesn't the, the... What was the question? I guess, are any of the pieces of legislation that are being proposed right now likely to lead to us having reduced <laughs> revenue? Uh, as far as I can tell, the proposal that started in the Senate is the one that's going to and that looks to be as close to the revenue control as it can be. The uncertainties that are out there. So you don't have anybody... No, there's a huge uncertainty in there that could be, I think there could be different legislation going to different directions for 
different reasons. <laughs> Either try to protect services, uh, use the funding, or but or because they want to protect the taxpayers. And yes, there are, there are legislative legislation there, but there are other legislation could be brewed there. I think at this point, if you we don't we don't know at this point what will happen eventually and prevail. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, Sandy, do you want to check in on? Do you want to respond to that or not? As far as <laughs> or not? Right, but are we not pat? Are we're not following in on lobbying on it, or we're there's multiple pieces. Yeah, I know. And all of them have different impacts and implications. And no, I'm not lobbying for okay. any of them. Dr. Sun, what? So we've had the, the, the tax discussion. Is there are there yeah. other things that you'd like to share with us this morning in relation to our budget yeah, we update? Actually, uh, we have, have a little more information on FY18. Okay, great. So actually I can share with you some information this morning. There, it is, It's just a plan. So uh, as you know, that we keep monitoring what's going on there and be ready to make adjustment either higher or lower to... Um, I only printed out this morning, so it's not able to... Center early. I apologize about that. Um, you have a copy too. Um, so, uh, as you already know, that the county has a mid year um, revenue shortfall and that requires um, savings plan on that. Um, one thing is, it's it's um, we benefit from some debt refinancing, which actually are likely to generate about 2.4 million savings, which uh, which actually fortunately help us avoid uh, more drastic measures in mid-year. And the rest of the agencies, as you all know, the county executive already asked them to offer reduction options here. We sit down together with all of them, try to go through it and make sure we only select the measures that has no or minimum impact on services here. If you look at the percentage there, most of agency end up have somewhere between 1.5 to 2.5 percent of reductions here. Some agencies list to zero or very small number currently is because they are in generally relatively small agency, really have no flexibility, or because of a couple of options um, they originally volunteer appears to have some consequence on services, so we end up not using that there. Um, obviously, uh, County Council, you are a legislative um, body, so we didn't really ask for anything. Whatever, if you are willing to participate, it's totally voluntary and uh, optional. Um, the total amount here is about $7 million to meet our target, and this is, uh, has been generated after careful examination with all stakeholders here. As repeated earlier, that this doesn't include any layoffs or change to collective bargaining agreements on that. Um, primarily, those savings coming from those, um, besides debt refinancing, is from um, attrition or turnovers and also different reductions, supplies, equipment, um, various operations, um, trainings, or, uh, and we talked um, with each of the departments to make sure that they can live with it, at least in a short run and without hurting services there. As you also know that the county executive has initiated conditional hiring freeze there. Um, excluding the priority positions here. So we are still in the process of doing that, and we asked each department to identify priority ranking, and the ones that are more important, uh, we actually allow them to continue, and the ones that, uh, at least at this point, of, higher, of lower priority, and we try to work with them to hold some. And not only that is try to secure the savings target to be achieved, but also to allow us to have some flexibility as we keep watching. Um, the budget in FY18, but also help us get us pre positioned for FY2019. As you already heard that FY2019 fiscal year will likely to be another challenging year, so some of those um, uh, vacancies we might have to either use partial year or have or full year savings here for get us through FY19. So that's the major um, highlights here. Um, 
So the next page just gives a, a little bit more narratives, but pretty much what I have already talked about, the general approach on that. And after that, obviously, if you have additional questions, your auditor's office will be happy to uh, answer questions. Yeah. I'm sorry? If we could just get this electronically as well, that would be great. Oh, sure. And I appreciate the level of detail. Mm -hmm. As do I. We, um, this is good information for us. Any other questions for Dr. Sun? All right. Well, Dr. Sun, thank you for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. And we have a presentation from Blossoms of Hope. Wanted to come in and talk with us this morning. Colleagues, after that, unless there is something um, that you feel important to have included in this morning's meeting from our reports or administrator or auditor, I'd like to immediately after this presentation move us into our closed session. Okay. All right. Good. Good morning. Good morning. All right, come on in. How about right up there where the microphones are so that when you speak, speak with us, um, the folks at home who are watching us via streaming and those who will be watching us um, in reruns will be able to hear your presentation. Welcome. We're glad you're here. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So. Press the button. Press when it shows green, you're good talking. to go. All right. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us today. Um, uh, I am the chair of the board of Blossoms of Hope and have been for about the last four years. Sometimes seems like four minutes and sometimes about 40 years, but you all know how that goes. But it's a terrific group of people, a very active board. Um, we have a great time, and uh, we perform a community service. Uh, we support the Claudia Mayer Tina Broccolino Cancer Resource Center, and we also, um, a couple of years ago with the, with the flood in Ellicott City, donated $8,000 to the ECP. Uh, we see ourselves as an organization that started off as part of Howard County Tourism about 14 years ago. Um, our major focus right now is to um, find uh, dedicated board members to expand our board and to become self-sufficient. Uh, we have been supported through uh, the county, through Howard County Tourism for many years, going all the way back when Jim Roby started Blossoms of Hope um, and hired Vicki Goodman to come in as our first executive director. Uh, so we're making great progress. Uh, we continue to be very active and involved, and this is our time of the year to uh, have our terrific events. We throw great parties, um, which is really kind of fun, but in order to be a standalone 501c3, we also um, need to be a uh, you know a real life fundraising machine. So part of what we're we're doing is we just recently hired a uh, executive director. She's part time, so we do have two part time employees now. Um, and I'd like to introduce um, everyone that's here with me today, so that you know who they are. And then I'm going to stop talking, and we're going to show the video, and then we'll answer any questions you might have. Great. Hi, I'm Sherry Collins Witzke. I'm the vice chair. I'm Vera Simmons. I am the other part-time employee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mimi O'Donnell. I was one of the very first people on this committee right. or on this organization, and I now have the emeritus status. <laughs> <laughs> that means we can keep her, but she doesn't have to come to the meetings. Right? <laughs> but it's really great to have uh, Mimi with us. And, and the, the emeritus status is something we recently started because we want to honor those that started, and uh, we'd like to continue to have them join and participate. So we would like to show you the video. The video we did uh, last year uh, kind of talks about what Blossoms of Hope does. Small word but boundless. Hope brings people together 
to achieve feats never before thought possible. In Howard County, the pink cherry blossoms of more than 2,000 trees have become a symbol of hope. Many for those coping with cancer or struggling after a devastating flood. For others, the pink flowers are a way to remember those who have lost their battle. And yet for others, they are simply the display of color bringing in the warmth of spring and the hope of another year of beauty and time together with family and friends. Blossoms of Hope is a champion of hope with a mission to improve lives of those with cancer and other needs. When my mom started the center, and I was actually on one of the committees to help with fundraising uh, way back in the day, I never imagined I was going to end up utilizing the services of the center. So not only am I a stage four cancer survivor, but I also am a board member of Blossoms of Hope. And in being a board member, I feel like it's wonderful because it's full circle, utilizing the center and then helping to sustain the center. So it's a really beautiful partnership between Blossoms of Hope and the hospital where we're able to raise awareness and funds to help sustain Claudia Martina Broccolino Cancer Resource Center. And at the same time, we get to beautify the county and do a few other really wonderful things for our community. As a counselor from the Howard County School System, during that time, I recommended the center to so many families who were touched by cancer, parents and grandparents, and the worst possible children. Uh, my mother used the center 20 years ago to the Blossoms of Hope and the um, other fundraisers. It has turned into a wonderful place. public has also gotten involved. Um, the tree represents hope and love. We frequently found that family members or a group of friends will buy a tree in memory of a loved one instead of flowers um, at the funeral or a charitable donation. About three years ago, my daughter Shannon passed away. And right after that, we received uh, a donation of Anne Blossoms of Hope cherry tree. Uh, the tree came at uh, a perfect time, but as it goes, our dilemma was we didn't really have a place to put the tree, and so my uh, best friend, Becky, agreed to plant it in her backyard. About a year and a half, my daughter bought a home in the country, and we really wanted that tree. It represented something very uh, dear to us. For me, the, the Cancer Resource Center, the Counseling Service was a lifesaver. My wife was diagnosed uh, roughly a year ago with inflammatory breast cancer. And uh, by trade, I'm a fixer of things, I'm a problem solver, and you know, those things are all largely for others. And I thought I could easily make, manage my problems, and cancer was overwhelming. Um, The, the service that the center provided, I would say, yeah, saved my life. With the center, uh, I found an outlet. There were, <clears throat> there were a lot of moments I realized I could not do this for myself. One thing that wasn't getting taken care of right away was, was me. Um, I reached out to Amy got an appointment and pretty much after that note for every two weeks. It was it was nice to have somebody to talk to, somebody to cry to, somebody who didn't judge, just listen, offer uh, offer you know, just some guidance and coping mechanisms. Uh, was great in regards to providing some resources for Evan. Yeah, I don't know where I'd be without them. When I walked through the doors, I just remember that feeling of calm. Finally, my big, strong <laughs> husband did take advantage of their support group for caregivers and family members. But by the, by the time showtime rolls around, people, they're pros. You know, they're pros, they're dancing, they're smiling, they're having fun, and just 
just for an afternoon, you can forget about the cancer and just, you know, live every girl's dream. Who doesn't like walking down and walk? Friends of Ann Moon contributed to present her with the founding father tree um, in Centennial Park and to honor her 12-year battle with cancer. When she passed, her family decided to, to host her celebration of life overlooking the trees in Centennial Park. And it became a place for her friends to place flowers and to visit from time to time to remember her. You see, the Blossom of Hope trees are well named and well loved. And people look forward to seeing those pink, beautiful blossoms every year as a beacon of hope and another year to enjoy. Through its events, fundraisers, long-lasting memorials, and beautification of Howard County and the region, Blossoms of Hope continues to support the needs of the community and be a champion of hope. hard to say anything after that isn't it um, we uh, showed that for the first time at our uh, our volunteer thank you um, that we do every year that Pete Mangione at Turf Valley hosts for us and uh, we're really proud of the work that we have done over the last 13 to 14 years um, we believe as a strong very active board that we can continue to support this community and uh, our purpose for being here, we're not here to ask for anything, so that's a good thing, right? So, but we are here to just make certain that um, folks in the community know and understand the work we're doing, and we, as we continue to grow this organization um, with our new executive director and uh, continue to support our community, we're you know, looking actively to become more involved. We've always been working through the Resource Center and, we, and you know, working with Steve at the hospital and the hospital foundation, um, you know, we continue to support that. We will with our events, but we're also looking for other opportunities to support our community. Working with the Ellicott City Partnership, the trees that we uh, made to, uh, that we offered to uh, the, the families of the folks that died from the flood. So we're continuing to try to find ways to support our community. We're blessed to live in Howard County. We want to continue to make certain that uh, the good work we do uh, can not only benefit our current charities, but others. Well, I, what I was going to say is um, thank you for the work that you do. Um, you are an example of the best in the county. And I hope that your being here today will reach somebody who doesn't know who you are, right? but somebody who may need you or may say, that's an organization I want to participate with. So I'm really glad you were able to come today. I'd like Vera just to spend a couple minutes to go through the busy schedule that we have to make certain everybody knows about some of the fun stuff we're going to be doing. First of all, we brought um, some cupcakes, some Blossoms of Hope cherry celebration cupcakes from Cupcakes and Company and some others. So please help yourselves. Um, we're starting off our cherry bration season on March 28th. We're having the cherry bration kickoff, and it's at the Medical Pavilion, um, the Howard County General Hospital Medical Pavilion. It's in the atrium. It's a beautiful setting. It's from 5 to 7 on the 28th of March. We then have a very busy April. We have Clark's Ellie Oak has a cherry bration days, April 7th and 8th. Um, the children can come in um, princess dress or pink and get to get a hay, free hay ride that day. So it's a lot of fun. And then we will, it's both days actually, and we will be hosting some crafts as well. We have the, uh, what you saw on the, the show, The Pretty in Pink, is coming on April the 13th at Turf Valley. There is also on April the 13th um, the, the, the um, Boston's Hope annual theme exhibition, exhibition reception at the Columbia Art Center. And that's a lot of fun. Um, they choose the winners that day, and there's some, some great time there. Um, 
on April the 27th is our annual 10th annual Pink Greens Golf Classic, and that's again at Turf Valley. On May 13th, Mother's Day, the Hills of Milltown 5K. It's a great way to get the kids up early and celebrating mom. And then we wrap up the, the summer season or the spring season with the Power of the Purse on June the, June the 11th from 4.30 to 7.30. Milltown is a is a great event, um, especially if you're watching. Uh, <laughs> having run it twice, well, running is a <clears throat> relative term. Shuffling it twice, uh, uh, it was it, it. The the folks there, it's got a great energy, specifically because of the purpose behind it. So, and they're they're having a new what we're going to call the Hill of Hope. Yeah. So you can conquer the Hill of Hope. Okay. If you're running and it, then so. stop. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in this. It's, I'll pay to, more if I can run less. Down. <laughs> you will have to get back down. Uh, the down is not as hard as the up. But okay. Very good. All right. I'd like to just um, offer, you know, our invitation to all of you to um, attend um, any or all of our events that uh, may interest you and um, come out and support us as well. We really uh, appreciate your time. Good. Thank you, so. I'm just here for support. <laughs> You're doing a great job. We're glad to see you. We're, indeed, indeed. Thank you all very much for being with us. Thank you for your time this morning. Yep. All righty. So, colleagues, um, at this moment, um, we are going to read all of the other reports. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to talk to um, Mr. Glenn Denning or Ms. Feldmark or any of the rest of us based on our spe uh, the specialties. But at this point in time, I move that this meeting be closed in accordance with Section 3, 305, B7, and 8, General Provisions Article Annotated Code of Maryland for the purpose of consulting with counsel to obtain legal advice and consulting with staff, consultants, and other individuals about any potential civil action or other uh, proceedings related to the implementation of the next generation air transportation system at um, BWI um, Thurgood Marshall Airport, pursuant to How Howard County Council Bill 8, 2017. Topics to be discussed may include legal advice about legal claims, legal issues, and legal strategies related to any potential civil action or other proceedings authorized by CB 8, 2017. Second. Ms. Sigety. Yes. Dr. Ball. Yes. Mr. Fox. Yes. Ms. Tarasa. Yes. Mr. Weinstein. Yes. So, colleagues, we will now adjourn our monthly meeting to go into closed session. At the conclusion of the closed session, we will return to open session for the purpose of announcing the time at which the closed session ended and to conclude the monthly meeting. However, no further business will be conducted after the closed session. So for those of you watching us online, we will be ending our streaming video at this point. Thank you all for being with us this morning.